Ditch those clowns and jokers. Join me in the middle with your independent minds. All you've got to do is click the subscribe button and ring that little bell, and you'll then get the most independent presentations on all of YouTube. Thanks for watching. At long last, the United States is out of Afghanistan. So did we win or did we lose the war? Carter Malkazian is the author of a brand new book called The American War in Afghanistan, A History. There's an excellent excerpt adaptation in Politico magazine from his book. Right now, it's posted in all of my social media. Who is Carter Malkazian? He served as a civilian advisor in Iraq and Afghanistan and was senior advisor to General Joseph Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from 2015 through 2019, and he joins me now. Carter, thanks so much for being here. I really re appreciated the adaptation that I read in Politico magazine. Well done. Thank you for having me, and I greatly appreciate the compliment. So is the better way to frame this conversation, did we win or did we lose, or did we meet our objectives? And if it's the latter, what were our objectives? So our objectives in Afghanistan, the one objective that stands throughout is to prevent terrorist attacks on the United States and to prevent terrorist attacks from being able to organize effectively in Afghanistan and in any way, again, come anywhere close to repeating what they did on 9-11. That goal has been there throughout the conflict. And that goal was at least partially met in that when we were there, we didn't face such threats. In the future, it looks like those, those threats are also going to be suppressed because of our, our presence in Afghanistan. All there is a possibility, as has been noted in the news, um, that those threats um, can now reemerge. Um, but for the time we were there, we did meet that part of our interest. But I think for Afghanistan, it means something larger to a lot of people. It's not just about CT, as we, as we tend to call it. It's about did we enable Afghanistan to stand up on their own and to survive on their own as a country? Did we enable them to form an effective democracy? Did everything we do in terms of helping with women's rights, with education, um, with reducing corruption, did those reforms make a difference and have they, and are they going to last? And on all of those scores, the situation looks much worse. We can see from the fighting going on in Afghanistan today, um, that it, the ability of a government to stand on its own is in deep question. So it's really hard to say that we've met that goal. And if the ability of the government to survive on its own is in question, then all the things we managed to do with, with all those things I just mentioned, women's rights, education, um, those are in danger. And then some of the other things we tried to do with like countering corruption or countering narcotics, those basically never succeeded in the first place. So when you put all that together, that's why it's really hard for me to argue to anyone that we didn't fail. I don't like saying that word, and, it, and, it, and it's loaded, and it causes a lot of people to be upset, especially people I know who have been in Afghanistan. Um, but I can't really effectively argue with people that we haven't failed when I look across those goals. There was a different way to go, right? I mean, this could have been approached more with a sniper than shotgun blast, almost as a law enforcement measure to go and get those responsible for the attacks on September 11, and then to call it a day. Was there a conscious decision? There must have been at the outset that that wouldn't be enough. There was a conscious decision uh, made in 2001 and then in 2002. 2001, we toppled the Taliban. And after that, the Bush administration is kind of deciding what to do. They've got a footprint in Afghanistan at that time. It was around 8,000 men um, and, and women. And they're looking at the situation, and you just have to understand the environment of that time. 9-11 had happened a few months back. The anthrax scare had happened. There had been other um, terrorist threats that emerged. And 9-11 really created the sense that it's possible that terrorists could not only blow up buildings. They might try to use chemical weapons or biological weapons, even nuclear weapons, the whole WMD thing. And that kind of threat before 9-11, that had been the stuff of movies. And now it was suddenly real. Um, and if you look at the, the opinion polls at the time, well, between, you know, up to 85% of American people were worried about another terrorist threat against the United States. 
And then you look at the past where we had got, helped it, Afghanistan against the Soviets and then we had stopped helping and there had been a civil war in the country. So the kind of lesson looking at the past was, well, if you leave, it's gonna become a mess again. So because of all those pressures, President Bush and his team decided, well, we need to stay a little bit longer. But their intention was to stay with a light footprint then. And we had a light footprint until about 2006 or so when it starts climbing up. Um, so I, part of it is that like, we forget a little bit about what it was like at the time and what the threats and the, and the conundrums were that were facing leadership at the time that, that ended up sort of staying in. Um, now, I'm not trying to bless things that the Bush administration did by any means. I'm just trying to show some of the historical factors that were at play. Understood. All right, let me ask this question. How much consideration was given at the outset to the possibility that as occupiers, if it were to become a long-term proposition, we'd actually make matters worse. And I ask this question because of what I read from your book, you then address the question of if in fact we did lose, why did we lose? And it's very hard for me to articulate in a sentence or two, but it, it, it includes an understanding of what really jihad means and what that meant to the people of Afghanistan who were not on our side. Yeah, um, and uh, the easiest way to think about it is foreign occupiers. There were foreign occupiers in Afghanistan. That was us, no, no offense to us, um, but we were there. Afghanistan is a country of a history of fighting foreign occupations where you can see the, the, how a young man feels about themselves, how they look at their, their value in their very society can be based on, well, have I stood up and met, and met um, what is meant to be an Afghan? And, I, and this isn't really all that much of an Afghan thing either. You can see in many, many countries that this dynamic has existed, Vietnam, even our own history. Um, so get, getting to your question, you asked, did we realize that? Well, ironically, uh, the Bush administration in 2001 was really worried about this. They were worried that they would trigger a reaction and that there'd be immediate reaction to American presence. Now, the thing that happened was there wasn't that kind of big reaction at first. Or if there was, it wasn't seen by us. The Taliban are toppled. They flee to Pakistan. Things look peaceful. Things look peaceful for four to five years. And this is another way that one can kind of, that it's easy to get stuck in the country because it doesn't look like it's going to become a raging insurgency. But over time, that dynamic starts to play more and more and more. The longer we're there, um, some of the mistakes that we make with civilian casualties or, or, or coming into homes play into this problem. And then when the Taliban start to attack again, they're able to spread their narrative, to spread this word around in a way that can mobilize people and get their fighters to, to fight harder. Um, so in a way, it's kind of like we, we had a hard time coming to grips with that this was a major factor. And to be honest, it's something that I've come to over years of study. And it is not a factor when I first came to Afghanistan in 2007 that I would have labeled as, as, as key, nor when I left after two years in Helmand province in 2011 would I have cited. It was only after repeatedly going there and talking to more and more people that I started to really feel this was something going on. And, and the thing that you're referring to, which was going on, is that the Taliban had a source of inspiration that we could never replicate. Is that a good way to say it? That is, a, that, that is absolutely correct and that the government can't replicate the same way because the government is working with us. And I'll give you an example. Um, the government, realizing that they had a, a problem being labeled as puppets or, or, or working with infidels, they would say, well, look, the Taliban, the Taliban work with Pakistan. So they're the puppets of Pakistan. Um, and there is, there, is, there is a story, which I don't think is a problem, I think it's true, where you have an Afghan commander on one side of the battlefield, talking on his radio to a Taliban commander on the other side. And they could do this because the, the frequencies are the same. And so the, the um, Taliban commander says to the Afghan commander, you are the puppets of America. The Afghan commander says back, you are the puppets of Pakistan. And the Taliban commander says, the Americans are infidels, Pakistan's are Muslims. And the moral of the story is the Afghan commander has no response back. Um, and this isn't, to be clear, this isn't really, it's not a point about there being something bad about Islam or something like that. That's not the point. The point is that if you're, some, if you're trying to fight for your country, but your government is aligned with a foreign occupier, and that foreign occupier also happens to be from a different religion, 
it can be much more difficult to motivate, to be motivated. As you wrote in The American War in Afghanistan, a history quote, the point is that it's tougher to risk life for country when fighting alongside what some call occupiers, especially when they do not share your faith. So what is the lesson then going forward? Because I look at Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and it seems like the expectation or the hope that we will be met as liberators doesn't come to fruition, at least not in the post World War II era. Yeah, that's so. That's a the, the biggest point I would make is that we should be lowering our expectations. Now, I'm not sure we're going to get into conflicts exactly like this in in the near future, but something similar could happen. When we have high expectations that we're going to enable a uh, government, we're going to work with to stand on its own, or we're going to be able to defeat the opponent entirely. On, um, I think those expectations are liable to face great difficulty. And it's better to think about how can I meet my objectives at the least cost possible? Um, how, how can I do things that it's sustainable, that I'm not taking a lot of casualties and I'm not, not investing a lot of US resources? Now that may be unsatisfying. Um, and if it's severely unsatisfying, we should be asking, should we be there at all in the first place? Or, sh- or is this interest doesn't really meet the cost involved? Carter, there's, there's, a, there's a corollary to all of this, at least in my mind, which is I think many of us have labored under the belief in the past that if only they had, whoever they might be, I'm using it in a broad sense, if only they had democracy, you know, if only this were a democratic nation and elected its leaders without recognizing that when we instill that or encourage it, they might be electing people who hate the United States. In other words, democracy is in and of itself not an end all from our perspective. So that's one thing people worry about a lot. People have worried about a lot with Afghanistan, um, both that they elect people they don't help us a lot or that maybe in the future they'll elect the Taliban or something like that. And that could be a problem. Right, right. Um, but I think overall what I, what I say is that um, I, I mean, I don't. I, I think our. I, I value democracy tremendously. Um, but I. I don't know that going into countries and expecting that the establishment of democracy is going to create stability. I don't think that that, that doesn't follow through to me. Um, that when we, when we we can try to establish democracy, but we have to understand that that's not necessarily going to be victory, or or even enable us to have an end game and to get out easily. Okay, I've saved the hardest subject for last. So I'm I'm thinking about the two of us speaking about what lessons can be drawn from America's two decade war in Afghanistan. And if I'm the mother or a father of someone who gave their life in that battle, an American soldier, what am I to think of all of this? And and does that mean that they died in vain? I mean, what what kind of a an interpretation can we offer them? that's not heartbreaking beyond what they've already sustained. I mean, so I, I, I've seen generals and officers you know, have to deal with this firsthand. And, and I don't, I'm not sure I can offer anything better than what they are able to do. Um, and I don't know that there is a perfect answer to, to reassure people. So I don't want to claim to have those answers. Some of the things I think about um, are, well, first of all, the soldiers that, that went over there, they went over there to protect America from a terrorist threat. And people believe there was a threat. And people believe that until fairly recently. Um, so we may in retrospect look back and we may question that. But I, I don't think that changes the importance of what they did for us. Everyone was worried in the United States about this. Everyone was fearful. And they were going to take care of that. And, and so that, that is the number one thing that I would say. I don't know if that's enough to, to reassure those who have lost. Um, but I think it's the best I can say. It's an important book. Is there one takeaway that you want to leave us with? The title is The American War in Afghanistan, A History. The author is Carter Mulcazian. I I think that probably a simple takeaway is we're very close to the event right now. Um, It's going to take some time for America to process this and understand where Afghanistan stays. And in some ways, we may have not come to the most difficult moment. The most difficult moment may be when we see Afghanistan fall to the Taliban or when we have to worry about future terrorist issues in the future. And I do hope America will be resilient. 
and not spend too many resources worrying about terrorism when we have a lot of other things that, that we need to pay attention to. Carter Mulcazian, thank you so much for being here. Good luck with the book. Thank you, Michael. Greatly appreciate it.